For today's reading, I share with you a poem by Peter Friedrichs. It's titled, Origins. What is the history of anything? This apple, let's say, that my grandson just picked as he sits on my shoulders, feet dangling like parentheses around my heart. Its father, a random visitor guided to Mother Flower by ancient knowledge, from a teeming hive of workers intent on serving their queen, that was brought to this orchard by an itinerant keeper who in spring drove a thousand coffee-fueled miles in under a month in a truck badly in need of a muffler, all the while reliving the fight he had had with his wife just before he left home, wishing his cell phone had service. Whose juice that drips in my hair from the boy's first taste of autumn mere moments ago flowed through the veins of this tree, which was planted decades before by a man with three sons, one of whom he disowned over what now in hindsight seems trivial. Not to mention the rain that fell this summer, broadcast in sheets of lightning and thunder that woke the baby who lives in a moldy basement apartment on the night before her father's first day of work in more than a year when he desperately needed the sleep. And the sun, whose rays crossed 93 million miles in under 10 minutes to fall on these leaves, and the face of my neighbor, who I learned just last week has skin cancer. This child on my shoulders, I hope, will remember me in this day, so full of sweetness and laughter and the simple pleasure of fruit. You can learn a lot about life from driving a taxi. A young man I know, I'll call him Andy, is a taxi driver. Andy relayed one of his taxi adventures with permission to share as follows. Busy night, been running all day, about to end the night, but take one last call. Woman needs picked up and she wants to make a round trip to some apartments. I get there, she hops in, and we start having a nice conversation. Asks if we can stop at a gas station first. I oblige. She comes back with a pack of cigarettes and a frown. Hops back in and says something like, I don't mind being hit on, but show some respect. I guess she'd been propositioned in a rather nasty way by someone inside. We get to talking about that and what causes that sort of behavior. Eventually, I say something cliche like, well, that's the best we can do. Define ourselves by our actions and build habits of those actions by caring respect for our earth, each other, and definitely ourselves. She goes quiet for a minute after that as I drive and then asks me to turn around and take her back to where I picked her up. I guess, he says, she was on her way back to fall into an addiction after a bad night. The woman told Andy, you help me stay strong and make good choices for the people I love. Andy describes how their interaction ended. To my protest, he says, she gave me the money she was going to use, wow and asked me my name and to shake my hand 
which she clasped with both of her own while looking into my eyes. As I looked back, behind her own brimming eyes, I saw steel tempered by the fire and the storm. The sea of life had apparently tossed this woman about a fair bit for her to be battling addiction. She was about to sink down. Something in Andy's words, and I can't help wondering, perhaps also something in the gentle nature of this young man who spoke the language of love, something in their exchange buoyed her up just when she needed it. She wanted to build good habits for herself, to respect herself, to be there for the people that counted on her. During what Andy thought was just a casual conversation, something in the interaction reminded his passenger what was at stake and reminded her that she could choose what she did next. <clears throat> well, we don't know precisely what happened next in her story. The rest of that happened outside the taxi cab. But we can be sure the circle moved on, another generation touched by the choice this passenger made, as it always does every round a generation. As Gail mentioned in the moment in UU history, I want to return today to process thought, a way of understanding life that I began sharing with you over a couple of Sundays in the spring. How might we understand this particular taxi adventure of Andy's through the lens of process thought? Recall that in this way of thinking, as we learn, as we suffer, as we enjoy, there is a sort of cosmic consciousness which takes into itself all the experience of all beings in the universe that takes in our feelings right along with us. This great spirit or cosmic consciousness learns from all the experiences it takes in and lures us, draws us toward choices that might lead to maximum joy and beauty and goodness for all. We may feel such a lure stirring within ourselves, the still small voice within in biblical language, or others in our life may influence us toward life-giving choices, as with Andy and his passenger. All of life is a flow of events, whether we are people or even down to the level of protons in this understanding, our life consists of droplets of experience and feeling and a series of choices. This flow of events and stream of feeling is even more real in the process way of thinking than the apparent stuff that we can sense with our five senses. And we have the freedom to choose what we will do in each instance. Just as Andy's passenger could decide if she was going to try to deal with whatever agitation she was experiencing by going and getting high again, or if she was going to take care of herself and be there for the people in her life that needed her to be whole. She chose the latter. But this was not inevitable. We do not always use our creativity and freedom to do things that benefit ourselves and the rest of life. We can and sometimes do make poor choices that result in less joy, less beauty, even harm to ourselves and others. Now, although it can result in pain or even evil, this fundamental quality of creative freedom is essential to life as we know it. For without it, life would not be the adventure that it is, an adventure that makes it possible to experience novelty and joy and beauty. This creative freedom that people have, that is an inherent property of life, is what makes Andy's encounters in his taxi so interesting. This is why he has taxi adventures. This particular taxi adventure that Andy relayed carries another reminder, at least for me, when I heard it. And this is the reminder that we are deeply interconnected with other people. None of the choices we make in all of our creativity and freedom as individuals is truly separate from the rest of life. Andy's passenger was influenced by this chance encounter with him and by the memory of people that she loves and who love and depend on her. In this sea of life, we are not just coasting on the waves. Whether we sink or swim, 
depends on those around us as well as our own choices. And in turn, our choices will influence others, both now and in the future. As we experienced in our time for all ages, we are all a wave on the ocean. We all belong to one another. We are all part of each other. We crisscross each other's lives, whether visibly on the undulating surface or invisibly in the deep currents below. This recognition of the deep interconnection of all people, all life, is another feature of process thought. I think many of us recognize this truth intuitively in our own experience, although it kind of cuts against the grain of our culture, which is more oriented to the individual and to personal achievement than the group and how we shape and are shaped by others. A good example is the painter, Vincent van Gogh. We might perceive Van Gogh as a lone artist suffering for his work, famously cutting off his ear. Though unrecognized in his lifetime, he possessed the single-mindedness that denotes genius, and so his gift was eventually discovered, or so we may imagine it. It turns out that Vincent Van Gogh's brother, Theo, was an essential part of the picture, if you'll pardon the pun. Vincent might still be unrecognized today if not for his brother. Theo bought Vincent's paintings, and as an art dealer with connections in the art world, Theo's belief in his brother made the difference between Vincent toiling in perpetual obscurity and becoming an art star. Theo persuaded Vincent to check out the art scene in Paris, connecting him with a group of oddball artists who were becoming known as Impressionists. In fact, uh, Van Gogh is now believed to have actually lost that ear, not by his own hand, but in a fight with the French artist Paul Gauguin, who was a fencer and may have sliced off Van Gogh's ear in the heat of a disagreement. <laughs> Johanna, Theo's wife, uh, was the one who kept Vincent's work in the public eye after both brothers were gone. So even creative people are not an exception to the rule of interconnection. Our connectedness extends far beyond our obvious companions like family and friends. The poem Origins that I read earlier exemplified this, unwinding a whole series of connections between the poet, his grandson, the bee and flower that produced the apple his grandson ate, the beehive, the beekeeper, with his truck trip and his wife and wishing he'd had cell service. The apple was connected to the tree and the man who planted the tree, and even the sun he regrettably disowned. And the rain, which was connected to the baby, woken by the storm who kept her father awake too. And the apple and the tree were connected to the sun, which was connected to the leaves and the neighbor they fell on. We learn at the end of the poem of the writers hope that his grandchild will remember this tableau and the sweet juicy apple and him, his grandfather, hopes that these connections will nurture this little person and become part of him every round, a generation. So many degrees of connection from a single apple tree. There's another way that uh, for me, trees provide an apt model for this deep interconnection that undergirds all reality. Ecologists studying forest resilience and regeneration have learned how the roots of trees are linked underground by a network of fungi that enhance their ability to gather nutrients. The trees also move chemicals across this network to communicate and share with each other. Mother trees, we could perhaps today say father trees, those that are the oldest, and the largest serve as hubs for groves of trees. These older, larger trees will pass nutrients along to the younger trees. And trees that receive more sunlight will also share nourishment with those that are in the shade, even regardless of whether they are the same species. I don't think this understanding of trees' chemical communication and mutuality had been described scientifically 
in the lifetime of the psychologist William James. But he intuitively turned to trees to explain the mystical sense of interconnection that he experienced. Here's how William James put it. Our lives are like islands in the sea, or like trees in the forest, which commingle their roots in the darkness underground. Just so, there is a continuum of cosmic consciousness against which our individuality builds but accidental fences, and into which our several minds plunge as into a mother sea or reservoir. The imagery of the web is also used to share this idea of profound connection. Bernard Loomer is a process theologian who described the relational power of beings who mutually influence each other. He spoke of a web to evoke how we are tied to one another in a vast network. Loomer, uh, in interestingly, was a member of the UU Church in Berkeley, California, later in his life. His concept of the interconnected web of existence may be the source of that language in our seventh principle, the interconnected web of all existence of which we are a part. Martin Luther King Jr. had another poetic way of putting it, you may have heard, when he said, we are caught in an inescapable network of mutuality, tied in a single garment of destiny. That interconnected web of all existence of which we are a part, that inescapable network of mutuality, these imply not only mutual influence, but even mutual accountability. Like a wave on the ocean, we are part of one another, and we owe the rest of life our most faithful effort to follow the lures we feel toward creating more joy, more goodness, more beauty, for the benefit of all. In her work on active hope, Joanna Macy reflects that it is the experience of deep interconnectedness with all that causes us to feel pain for the world. And in turn, when we allow ourselves to experience pain, our own or others' pain, when we honor that pain, we can gather the energy to take action to heal the world. I can see this as one way that our profound interconnection and our creative individual freedom tie together. If we know ourselves to be caught in an inescapable network of mutuality, we will use our creative freedom to serve life. And as we make choices that benefit the whole, we may even find our own networks of connection growing stronger and more palpable. Henry David Thoreau, the one-time Unitarian and member of the original Transcendentalist Circle, does not have the reputation of connecting deeply with others. Nature, maybe. People, not so much. But peel back his story, and we find there, too, a subterranean network of connection and care. My colleague David Kohlmeyer observes that when Thoreau retreated to his cabin at Walden Pond, he was in his mid-twenties, and he was coping with the death of his brother. This brother, his dear friend, had died in spasms in Henry's arms. Ralph Waldo Emerson's two-year-old son, with whom Henry was also close, had died around that time as well. The only woman Henry would ever court had spurned him. And on top of all that, he, quote, accidentally set a forest fire which destroyed much land that he loved, giving him the reputation in the local community of not caring about creation. Imagine that. Kohlmeyer observes, his fleeing to Walden was the act of a lost soul in great grief. Despite his reputation for rugged individualism, Thoreau writes in Walden in his journals of how much he wishes there were communities where he could be himself without doctrine how much he simply isn't cut out to be alone and hates being a hermit. So what does young Henry do with this longing for connection besides riding Walden? 
Well, during his retreat of grief and soul searching at Walden Pond, Thoreau remained more engaged with the wider world than we are often reminded of. His later speech and essay on civil disobedience grew out of an experience that took place then as he protested what he saw as the unjust, imperialistic U.S. war with Mexico. Even if he was feeling on the outside of human community somehow, his conscience still called him to act in solidarity with others. Very few as heroes, patriots, martyrs, reformers in the great sense, and men, he said, serve the state with their conscience also, and so necessarily resist it. The civil disobedience that Thoreau advocated is a form of fidelity to the whole of life, an acknowledgement of our deep interconnection, and a use of one's creative freedom to serve life and love. I believe that is the answer for all of us, certainly for all of us who are inheritors of this liberal religious tradition. Wherever the interconnected web of life is at risk, wherever the garment of mutuality is rent, we are called to respond with the fire of commitment. We are called to use our freedom and creativity to bring about more joy, more beauty, more love. Even grieving young Thoreau managed to do it. Let us go and do likewise. Amen.